Okay, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thanks for coming, and uh, I hope you're going to find this presentation uh, uh, interesting, and I think the topic is uh, is quite actual. So my, my name is Vittorio Manente, and I'm uh, the founder and owner of MVM Alpha Capital. So we started this, I started this company back in uh, 2017. My background, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist or a fund manager by background of what I studied on uh, I, I started the company because I, I wanted to establish, uh, I, I want to start a, a second career. Uh, and at that time, the only thing that I thought I know how to do and I like to do was uh, just financial engineering, investing with money. So I started the company around that time. And then since then, we grew up. But by background, I'm, I'm an engineer. So um, I, have, I have the background in uh, power train engineering and um, an energy analyst. And I have like 17 years of experience within this field. Well, originally, I'm Italian. Then I left Italy when I was, in, let's say, 22, and I've lived in a, in a number of countries. And right now it's like uh, five, six years. I live in uh, I, I live in France, right? And with this said, I, I can start presenting um, yeah, the, 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 the work that, that, that I've done in the last uh, year or so on whether or not it's the right time to short the US not market. And as, a, as, as everybody knows right now, we know that the answer to this question is yes. But you, you need to think a little bit about on um, wh when this question was formulated. Because the question was formulated, I mean, I, I came across uh, the, this point back in February 2021. And uh, at that time, nobody was talking about uh, inflation, the heats, and so on. But uh, yeah, I, I, I made an observation based on uh, some of the models we had uh, within the company. And based on that, we developed some theories and uh, we start uh, investing uh, accordingly. So, and when it comes to the, the rundown of today, I will start giving an introduction of uh, the firm and our investing approach. And then I will move on towards how we came up how we came up across this opportunity and why we think it's uh, the way to go. And lastly, if uh, you don't have any questions along, along the way, I will take some questions at the end of this presentation. And just be before going ahead, I would just be, we would like to read this disclaimer. And the basic disclaimer says that, like everybody else, I, I, I do mistakes, sometimes much more than other people. and. Although I put on my effort to provide accurate information, it might happen that some of the information that I'm showing you are not accurate. And second, I'll, um, I'll present a, a large number of concepts. And if you decide to use this concept, you're basically going to get your own risk. Right. And, and with this said, let's start by giving an overview of the firm. And like, like I mentioned before, we started the firm in 2017. We, with the idea to start a second career because at the time we were working in an engineer. And like many people in the past, what I wanted to create was a product that was breaking the thread off between risk and reward. And because of my background, I, I'm an engineer, I'm not an economist, and you know, I'm, I'm not a, a, I'm not good and able in value companies. Well, the, the approach that I was following at that time and right now was is to use quantitative methodologies to define investing as strategies. So basically, I, I try to, through, through the use of statistics, what we do is, is to take uh, investment decisions that have the highest chances of success. It doesn't mean that we have 99% chances of success. As an average, we are right 72% of the time. But over the last four years, it has been worth. We have one flagship investment strategy, which is called Next Alpha, and we have implemented this strategy since the company inception. And we provide this strategy both in the United States, in cooperation with the fund of fund, that is called LLC, and in Europe through separate financial accounts. So, 
about the strategy. So next alpha is a is an umbrella strategy that is made by four parts. We have one part that is investing in uh, index funds represented in the U.S. equities. And what we do over here is to look at the price action in the volatility domain. And by looking at the, the volatility of the market, we take investment decisions based on these parameters. So we decide how much money to allocate to a trade, when to enter or exit a trade, and in which index to be invested in. Then we are also trading uh, volatility products. And, in, and when we trade volatility products, we I don't know if you're familiar with those, we invest in both long and short volatilities depending on how the big term structure look like. And we, all, and, and we basically, fundamentally, we take decisions based on the big future movements. Then we have another part, which is investing in futures through, through the use of options. This strategy is also just a statistically based. And what we do, we, we take market neutral, market neutral bets. And our decisions are based on the implied volatility of the assets we would like investing. And then we have the um, the last part of the, uh, the last part of this umbrella strategy. That is the macro part. And uh, and with this with this part, which is also the focus of today's presentations, we take investment decisions that are based on highly probable outcomes, like in the case of, um, like you're going to see now in the case of shorting the, um, the, uh, the future bond market. And uh, like everything else in life, uh, next alpha, it has been, it, it has evolved over time because along these five years, we learn what it works, what it doesn't, we saw opportunities, and we basically constantly try to make everything better over time. All right, going to the juice of this presentation. So um, within the companies, we have, we have, we have a number of uh, models. And the, the way we use this, the way we use this model is to, is to get a direction indication on the status of the economy. So what, what I mean by that is that we take our models, we look at the, what the model predicts and what the, and what the market does. So we, we try to understand whether or not there is a devi deviation or are in a, they go in hand in hand. We, uh, uh, unless there is like an opportun opportunity that is very obvious, that is favorable to invest in, we seldomly use this model to take, uh, uh, to place direction on that. And, and the reason why we, tendentially we do so is because we don't know what is going to converge towards what. And the second thing is, um, even if we are right in the direction of um, our forecast, we don't know when things are going to happen. And a, a typical example, it can be what happened during the dot-com bubble. So many people predicted that the market was overvalued. But if somebody would have shorted the market at that time, it might have a, I mean, it wouldn't have had that positive outcome because it, it took a, a couple of years before the market corrected itself. All right. So, um, going to February 2021. So, it, it was February 2021, and I was running the uh, consumer price index model. And what we noticed at the time it was that the predicted CPI was substantially higher than, um, th th than the actual value. So I, I started to make some research to, to understand where the model was going in one direction, where the actual value was um, was pointing in another, in another direction. And like we, we know now, the, the, the main reason was the quantitative easing that we had at the time, right? The quantitative is that we have at the time. So, if if, we, if we're looking at the U U.S. money stock, so prior to the, prior to the pandemic, the U.S. money stock was growing at the rate of like 0.5 percent month over over month. But after the March April 2020, 
there has been an increase in the U.S. money stock, and this increase was substantial. And as a result, our, our CPI model was predicting a CPI value that was much higher than uh, the actual market value. But now, if you put your, your head like it was back in uh, Q1 or Q2 2021, so at, at that time, equities were rising, so the US money stock was growing at the rate, so whatever. And that, so the CPI, there was a mismatch between uh, what the model was saying and what the actual CPI was. So at that time, we could have looked at the situation and said, okay, so what? So what? But the thing is, if you, if you think in perspective and you think a little bit ahead, if you're going to be in the long term, just not a month, not three months, but six months or four months, month and a half. If the money stock keep, keeps on increasing, as a result, for a fixed number of goods, the price of the goods is going to increase. Okay, I'm oversimplifying, that, over, oversimplifying a little bit the concept, but just to give an idea. And, and as a result, the um, inflation is going to go up. And if the inflation is going gonna, is gonna to go up, what happens to the real bond yield is that the real bond yield is going to be a negative number instead of being, it's going to be a, a, a negative number. So if the real bond yield is a negative number, at the end, even more money need to be printed. So the US money stock index is supposed should be increasing more than what has been historically increasing. This in turn is going to create more inflation. If nothing is done to the nominal bond yield, the real one is going to get even more negative. And, it, and potentially we might have like a runaway effect if something is not done. So my, my thought at that time was that there's something that has to be done to control this inflation is to raise the nominal bond yield. Uh, if, if we assume that just inflation is mostly due to to this situation, and we just forget for a minute for a minute what's happening with the um, supply chain issue. All right. So I, I, I saw this as an opportunity, and basically, as an in a way an unsustainable situation that, that eventually people would have started to notice, people would have started to talk about that, and eventually would have corrected itself. The question is like at that time the question was I, I basically I didn't know when it was going to happen, but I thought that eventually it was going to happen. So what I did next was trying to figure it out at what level the uh, the nominal the nominal bond yield in the US who could get in order just to to stop this runaway effect. And uh, yeah, to, to, to figure out this number, I took another, another model of mine. And the, the main assumptions I, I made at that time when I was running the simulation was, try, was assuming that all the decision makers are rational and they want to keep inflation under control. And uh, yeah, I, I, I ran the model just trying um, Try, try different things, just assuming uh, different scenarios in terms of projected money supply, projected GDP, or um, projected increase in uh, basic points, and so on. And at the end, basically, the, the model was saying the model was saying that if in September 2021, the 10-year nominal bonds bond yield is in the range of one half percent, eventually. To contain this inflation runaway, we might see this number going up between three and a half and four and a half percent in the next 25 to 70 to 75 months, starting from September 2021. And if, if you can recall, around that time it was the time when people start to talk about inflation and start also to talk about that. The possibility to increase uh, uh, 
in the direction of one unit, right? So that was the uh, ballpark I estimated uh, on where um, things might go. And then when I when I made this observation, the next point was all right. So given the current situation, how, is there any way to profit or to capitalize on, on this observation? And, uh, and if we are basically expecting the yield to go up, then what is going to go down is uh, of course the, the future. Uh, the future. So the idea I had at that time around September, October 21, was to go short on the uh, on the US bond future markets. And depending on what we are shorting, whether it is the uh, the, the long term keynote or the medium term keynote, then based on where the nominal yield might go, we can have an, an estimated uh, view of, of where our profits might be. All right, so that, that's what we did in uh, September, October 2021. And then the, ne the next question we had, like every uh, sound investor was okay, we, we know when to enter a trade. So the next question is when we should exit the trade. So we, we didn't want to use just the model to tell us uh, at what yield to get out of the trade. But what, what, what we thought it was more sound to do, it was to look at the market dynamic to guide us when to exit this trade. And in my opinion, the, the ideal time to get out of this trade is when the real bond yield will be in the positive territory. So right now, as per last week, we were in the range of like a minus 5% when it comes to the 10 year yields. So as soon as I, I will see that the number gets in the range of zero or slightly above zero, in my opinion, that's the right time to uh, to get out of the trade. All right. So the next question, so that's that's how we come up with the. That was right after the lesson to say that like the short story on how we come up with the idea of open this trade. If you recall the timing, we got the idea around February 2021, and then it took us like uh, four to six months. So we just have a good grip on uh, what we wanted to do and then we decide to go ahead. So just, I've summarized roughly six months in a, in a few minutes. And uh, th the next thing we start to look into was about uh, was, uh, was about the equity market. All right. So what's going to happen to the equity market if decision makers will be operational and uh, they will move the leverage of the economy as they might do with the yield. So I, I took my uh, S&P 500 model and uh, I ran the simulation using the same uh, um, the same parameters that I used to run the previous simulation. And in September 2021, according to my model, the market was 18% overvalued. And if I assume that the market is Without emotions, without dynamic, and it just follows say, a kind of like an emotion line. Then, according to the model, it will roughly take 36 months before the uh, S&P 500 would reach uh, its fair value. Of course, we all know that the market has a certain dynamic, so um, the path is not going to be a straight line. I think. Everybody's looking at what's going on in 2022. Yep, the, the market behave in every way, but not in a straight line. It, it behave in a straight line, but in a downward straight line. And uh, even though we made this observation, in my opinion, I, I personally would never bet against the, the equity market because, in a way, it's much harder to forecast what will happen, not because we might get the direction wrong, but we might get the dynamic wrong. And if we get the dynamic, the sentiment of people wrong, then yeah, 
I, 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 don't, I don't see. I don't see. I don't see there's a safe way to proceed. So, and with this, I, I've concluded what I, what I wanted to say. And basically, in conclusion, uh, I would say that inflation right now, as, as many of us know, is running high as a result of the quantitative easing and also price shortage. So this presentation has been focused around the quantitative easing. And as a result of this, the treasury bond yield is negative. And if something is not done, we might have run away in uh, inflation. And the only way, in my opinion, to contain this is just to raise the nominal bond yield as, it's, uh, as it is happening uh, right now. And according to, to the model and that the simulations are done, the yield, the nominal yield should be raised above three and a half percent. As we have seen before, we, we might land in something between three and a half and four and a half percent. And with the same assumptions, what we have seen that the US equity market might reach its evaluation within the next six months. And also, in my opinion, based on the analysis I've done and the assumptions I've made, uh, there might be an opportunity to bet against, uh, to bet to bet on the on the rise of uh, the threshold yields. So. With this, I'm done. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to take them. So, Victoria, quick question. Um, are you more uh, on the fundamental side in terms of your analysis, in terms of your projections, or are you on the technical side? Uh, for, for the models, for the models, we are, I'm on a fundamental side. Mm -hmm. For the investments I make, I, I, I use statistics. I, I don't use. I, I mostly, I seventy-five percent. I use statistics. For okay. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, your uh, models, in terms of your uh, predictions, so how do you, I don't know if I'll, if I can ask you that, but how did you fare against uh, let's say uh, big investment houses if you track that uh, metrics? Come again. So you just ask, it, ask me the straightforward question. Just don't don't take me around the concept, please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Like, if you if you're tracking, like, if you're tracking the profitability of your portfolio, that which is basically a reflection for your quality of predictions, right? So how do you compare to the uh, let's say to the average market, and then how do you compare to uh, big uh, investment houses with all these tackies, with all these uh, quaints uh, working for them and uh, okay, making it? So home. how am I performing this year? Okay, good. No, how not not this year. I mean, you can you can look back like five years, for example. That's uh, well, the, the strategy is almost five years. So, um, so uh, up to uh, up to May two thousand twenty-two, our annualized return has been twenty-one uh, percent in the range of twenty-one percent. The annualized return, we had a correlation with the market of eighteen percent, and uh, up to the end of May uh, May two thousand twenty-two, our return in two thousand twenty-two was minus eight point something percent mm -hmm. and right now in uh, in june we are down one and a half percent so when the equity market has, has, has lost up to this moment like when i look at the market today it was like a what was it 20 plus percent this year we are we are down we are down 10 11 percent so, okay and we, we they, yeah, the, the oh, of course I'm not happy, but um, I, 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 if I just need, if you are asking for a question about just the, the, the strategy, so basically the, the way that I try to build up the, the next start of strategy was a way that I can take advantage when the market rallies 
and then I'm into safety when uh, uh, when the market was negative. Now, so in terms of how the strategy performed this year, I'm quite satisfied because I didn't experience I didn't experience uh, as much drawdown as the equities. Okay, 10, 11 percent. It's high. It's annoying from my side. Uh, I think that for the investors, the pain level is in the range of like uh, 12, 15 percent up to 15 percent. You can start to see redemption. So I'm kind of satisfied with where I'm now. The only part, because I'm an engineer and I always think about the worst rather than think about the best. The only thing I, I, I found very, very strange this year, it was how the market volatility is behaving in relationship on uh, how much the equity market has gone down. Because usually when the market goes down 10, 15, 20 percent, the VIX increases in values quite sharply. And if you look at the, the VIX term structure, you say it, it, it gives an indication, it gives a, a clear indication that the market is crashing and crashing quite violently. At least this has happened historically since 2004. So if you look at all the data on how the VIX moves, this has been a quite useful method to understand when the market is crashing. The strange part of this year, it has been uh, that the market crash has not been, so to say, fairly big because all the big stem structures have been moving in a, in a bearish way, but not bearish enough to say go long in volatility and take advantage of it. And just make sure that your tail edge strategy is going to continue so you make profit when the market goes down. So, yeah, o overall, I'm satisfied about, about the performance. I just, just I'm just a little bit puzzled by how the market is behaving. Mm. Yeah. Do you make do you make adjustments to your model, to your forecasting model, like as you go, as as you proceed, as you go, do you make adjustments, uh, or do you like okay, so this is my model, I stick to it, and uh... no, 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 no. Um, it, it, it depends. It, it, it really depends. Am I, I? I try. I try not to think. Because um, I, I got into finance back in, in 2011. I got fascinated by finance in 2011. And, and around that time, I, I was investing money, but I was investing money based on uh, subjective decisions. And doing that, I, 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 doing this subjectivity, I, it, it wasn't the way to go. I, I wasn't the best person to, to get directions. So, based on the experience, and I start to use statistics. So, um, go, going to your question, go back to your question. If I have a good, I always stick to the good. So I, I'm never in front. I'm never in front of the computer, just opening the trade manually. So I have an algorithm. The algorithm is in Python, and the Python code is controlled in my brokerage account, all the SNS accounts, and just the thumb of the thumb account. So just it basically, it, it's, it's a computer doing the trades. Now, when when it comes about uh, when it comes about the modeling. So what has happened in the past, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the future. So uh, in the past, I, I was I was going long the bond market when the market was getting bearish. But once I made the observation that eventually this mechanism would have been broken because if we go into recession, bonds cannot go even more negative than even more negative than that now. What I did the next is to just Take away the bond part of the portfolio. So when when the model was reaching from negative to bonds, and then I basically only focus. I, I remove that part because I thought, okay, in the future you're not gonna work anymore. And then I just update the model that way, and then I ran the model accordingly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mm, once the model is just defined, I I, I never override what what the model does. 